actually think of LTE launch as two phases. Uh, the first phase will be first half of 2012, where we enable 1900 spectrum or the G block, um, and we will, in addition to that, go and touch everything in single cell site over two years, and enhance backhaul, and get to all the way to 270 plus million pops. The coverage will be better than the 3G coverage, even with all the improvements, because it counts on all the improvements that come with LTE, things like 2x2 two two MIMO, uh, tower top implementations, and so on. The second phase of LTE launch that we're working on in parallel is uh, release 10 or LTE advanced in the first half of 2003. So I probably should just explain a little bit why would we even talk about it now. Um, the, the key enabler for us here is that we're going out there to invest in a brand new network. Um, that brand new network has significant capacity, a lot of performance, very large radios, and latest and greatest software. It's a lot easier for us to build an LTE advanced network from day one and only launch pieces of it along the way than come in and just do at least nine and just turn around in a few months and begin the deployment and development of, of the latest generation of LTE. So all the radios are capable of handling 4x4 MIMO. The software we're testing in parallel is capable of doing all the feature set that comes with LTE Advanced. Everything from uh, interference management, uh, capacity improvements, um, any sort of spectrum management that we want to do in a special way. Um, uh, we have not talked about any specific carrier aggregation we are going to do, but that certainly is something that we're testing and analyzing to see what we would do. Um, and that release would come in first half of 2003. It's also the up first opportunity for us to add additional spectrum. Uh, we are working now um, through um, a series of testing and regulatory bodies and standards activities. Um, to uh, get uh, 800 spectrum that we use today for the IDA network to be usable for LTE, so that would be one aspiration to get that done at that time. We're also, as you know, working um, on development for the 1.6 spectrum from LightSquare, um, and that spectrum is still going through regulatory approvals, and assuming it does get the regulatory approvals, that would be the opportunity to launch that at the same time. The combination of all that additional spectrum and all of the enhancement in feature and going to a 4x4 MIMO um, and the additional software improvements will allow us to boost the speed of this network, another jump, and uh, that would be the second release of LTE that we're working on in parallel. We have used Clearwire for our WiMAX devices uh, for quite some time now. I started working with Clearwire uh, five years ago before it was called Clearwire in the way that it is today. And we've certainly done a lot of work together to make WiMAX a reality. And WiMAX has been very, very good for us. Great speed, great performance. The devices that run WiMAX, like Evo, have been very successful. And customers have been very satisfied with them. So clearly, we're happy and thankful for all the work that Clearwire has done and all the relationship we've had developed over time. I, I think we're both now at a point where we realize that uh, the next step investment uh, for uh, WiMAX looks like LTE. Uh, there are ways to invest to go next generation WiMAX, and that also requires a lot of capital investment. But the ecosystem now is such that LTE is an easier, more uh, long-term leaning, uh, more standards accepted uh, and commonly accepted spec as, uh, ecosystem than WiMAX. So the next step investment looks like LTE for both of us. Uh, we're in agreement what that is. It's LTE, uh, LTE TD. Uh, we have uh, announced this morning that we've reached a tentative agreement uh, towards uh, formalizing a plan to work together to make that spectrum a reality in LTE, LTE TD. Um, and that means developing the chip ecosystem, developing the network interfaces, all the integration capabilities between the, uh, our two networks, our devices, um, and allowing for that spectrum to be usable uh, for our customers as well um, as another uh, ability to add on top of the LTE network that I described. We will both using, be using the same LTE from a standards perspective. LTE, I'm sorry, LTE release 10 and release 9 and all of the feature set that comes with the roadmap, the spectrum that we own 
is organized around FDD technology uh, in 1.9 and in 800. And the spectrum they own for 2.5 is organized around TD technology. And so um, the network and the devices will be capable of handling the different types of spectrum but in a seamless way that all looks like one LTE stack and one common feature set and one common customer experience, it would just look like additional spectrum to support capacity and speed. Um, small cells are very critical in the end of the day for all of us. Um, here's probably the best way I try to describe small cells to people. Um, back in the old days, really, really old days, like five years ago, uh, when the cell phones was mainly used outdoors, um, <laughs> when you know, dry, it used to be primarily in the car, um, the challenge was really covering uh, outdoors. Uh, you had some traffic indoors, but that was the minority. Um, and as people now have changed their traffic profile very significantly in the last five years or so, they've managed to move most of their traffic indoors in their homes, in their offices, and other places they go. Um, the need now for predictability of capacity and speed indoors have gone up dramatically. Um, it also, uh, the other trend that's happened is we went from lower speed to higher speed. As we went to higher speed, now a few devices are capable of creating a pinpoint hotspot. Uh, say uh, five of your friends all streaming at the same time in a Starbucks might be enough to create a hotspot in the network now. And if they keep going to the same Starbucks every day and keep streaming every day, that becomes a permanent hotspot in the network. That didn't used to happen in early 3G networks because uh, five of your friends going in to do text messaging or liked email in Starbucks did not harm the network in a way that is impactful. So the trends of people doing more indoors, expecting a lot more speed, and at the same time, the opportunity to create hotspots of, from a capacity perspective that are very, very limited, now is opening up an opportunity for small cells because the, the easiest, most cost-effective solution for these hotspots, especially if they keep recurring, is to go put a very, very small cell site there. And with the miniaturization of electronics and uh, cost curves now, you can now literally take a cell site and put it in less than $10,000. Now that you can do a cell site less than $10,000 and you, it has the capacity that's very significant and you know where that hotspot's happening, the most effective solution is to go put that very small cell site in that location to relieve the capacity. Uh, the other reason you need small cells is because what we've learned out of the iPhone and the Androids and all of the smartphones the last three years is that uh, you cannot predict the traffic patterns two years out. The old model of adding capacity was you do cell splitting, you go add another macro site, you go through zoning and leasing and finding a location and do all the installation. Well, that might be 18 to 20 months to 24 months. In 18 to 24 months, you don't even know what devices you're selling anymore, <laughs> you don't need, let alone all the traffic patterns. So you need small cells to be, to be, to be able to react very quickly. Uh, there's still a lot of challenges with small cells, but the combination of being able to do cost-effective deployment in very pinpoint location and the ability to react very fast with small cells, um, that creates a really huge opportunity for operators to be able to manage their capacity um, and manage their cost structure in a way that you're not able to do without small cells. Uh, you still need a macro network. Um, I would com describe it as uh, one of the tools in the toolbox. Um, the, the most common way you can describe small cells as part of the tools, in the early 3G networks, we used to call them repeaters. You know, you have a house or a building and the signal doesn't come in well, you put an antenna to propagate the signal from outside inside, you know, it costs a couple few thousand dollars and that solves your problem. Repeaters don't work in the 4G environment because in 4G you don't just need to repeat the signal, you actually need to have a high quality signal, you also need to have a lot of capacity in order to manage, otherwise you're just degrading the macro environment. So instead of repeaters in the 3G world, now we have um, picocytes and femtocytes in the 3G, 4G world to help relieve the capacity and provide for quick relief. And it's, it's in combination with the macro network you built. There's a lot of places that the most cost effective thing to do is to build the macro network.
as part of Network Vision, we're not just investing in 4G, we're investing in 3G as well. So we're investing in the latest and greatest 3G technology, for example, OneX Advanced on CDMA. OneX Advanced allows for high quality and high definition voice. So we have the tools to be able to invest in next generation voice even on CDMA, uh, but regardless of that, the, the reason we would deploy VoIP or voice over LTE from a consumer perspective is that it would simplify the device. If you have a device that uses data heavily and you can transform voice into a data application, you would take a lot of simplicity and cost and you would boost the performance of that device. And that's what the consumer would see. You obviously would be able to open up the voice to more applications, but you can do that in today's technology as well. Um, in, in our plans, we intend to, to launch uh, uh, VoIP over LTE in the first half 2013 to at least a subset of the devices. Uh, we don't have a plan to say it's all going to be all 1X or all it's going to be Volte or all going to be uh, VCC traffic. There's, we see multiple streams of ways you can deliver voice and we see ourselves to uh, supporting multiple streams. As the technologies evolve over time, there'll probably be a dominant um, and it most likely will be over time. Volte is the dominant voice technology, but that will take some time. We want to make sure that that transition does not in any way impact the voice performance that we provide to our customers today. Um, and that would be something to watch. The degree of optimization on the radio network and how well it supports the quality voice that you want.